Okay, we're going to be continuing with some DNA structure, some of the higher level, uh, more complex features of DNA before we dive into what DNA actually means. Okay, so this is just, we're talking about the chemical structure of DNA. So, so far you've learned about uh, these little shapes right here. Okay, and then you should be able to draw something like this with the phosphate. This is a ribose sugar. And these are the bases, or the, the code, we can call it the genetic code. There's only four letters we've been introduced to so far, and they are A, T, G, and C. We've learned that A binds together with T, always, and they form two hydrogen bonds in between. And G always binds with C, and there are always three hydrogen bonds in between as well, too. We've also learned the word anti-parallel, is the way that we describe how these uh, two strands, so if you consider this as a strand on the left, and this as a strand on the right, joined together by these hydrogen bonds in between. They run in different directions, hence these arrows here, more on the numbers in a little bit. Um, and the other one points the other direction, so we call that anti-parallel. They are parallel as they run next to each other, but anti in the sense that uh, one is facing the other direction. So briefly over here, these nucleotides, so each one of these is called a nucleotide, each little subunit here with a circle a pentagon and a little rectangle. Uh, some of you had questions about, well, what do these structures actually look like in detail? Like, what, is that A really a rectangle? Actually, it's not. Uh, we're going to get into that a little bit, but you don't need to be able to draw the entire structures out. So let's start up here. Nucleotides are held together by covalent bonds. So what that means is this as one nucleotide right here, the bonds that I'm going over in red here are actually covalent bonds. These are all covalent bonds. They're very strong. They hold these strands together uh, very, very carefully. And even within the molecule here itself, these are covalent bonds. Okay. The bases, however, in the middle with these dotted lines are held together by hydrogen bonds. That's very important. We're going to be able to break that apart depending on the type of the type of reaction that's actually happening with various things that DNA can do. Really quickly, purines are A and G. Okay, so A and G will bind to T and C. So A binds to T and G binds to C. A and T makes two hydrogen bonds. C and G makes uh, three hydrogen bonds, as you can see here. So you may have noticed there's a new word. Uh, where's my highlighter? A couple new words, purines and pyrimidines. So this is another way to categorize these things, and it's a little bit confusing because it's A that binds to T and G that binds to C. In other words, one of these is a purine and one of them is a pyrimidine, and so they always bind together. So if you actually take a look down here, uh, there's a little graph that shows this. A, the purines are A and G. I'll give you a way to remember that in a second. So they're slightly larger structures, and the pyrimidines are T and C. So you can see that if I were to bind a G to an A, I can't, but even if I could, then I'd have two big molecules bound together in the middle, and I'd end up with a very long uh, ladder rung in the middle here. So that's not going to work out. So we have an A and T, and so the total width of these is actually the same, so that's why the molecule can be kind of consistent. Pyrimidines are T and C. Here's how I remember that. Uh, remember this phrase, pure as gold, will help me remember that purines are A and G, pure as gold, purines A and G. What about pyramids? Oops, yeah, pyramids. For pyrimidines, you can remember this, pyramids took centuries, so that's P for pyrimidines, sounds like pyramids, and then T and then C. That should help you with that a little bit. So just a recap, it's the exact same thing as we've written up here. Anti-parallel strands run in the opposite direction. Okay, now let's take it to the next level about understanding these. You so you should be able to identify these as covalent bonds, hydrogen bonds, A and G, pure as gold. A and G are purines, and T and C are pyrimidines. Pyramids took centuries. Now let's go and examine one of these uh, sugar molecules up close. And in chemistry, we actually number, we have to number some of these uh, just for identification purposes. So if you actually take a look at this particular pentagon or one of these pentagons and zoom in, look at this ribose sugar, you should recognize the shape. There are five carbons in ribose. Uh, 
and they are numbered as follows one two three four and five you can think of it as clockwise starting from where one o'clock would normally be and the fifth one is outside of this uh, five-sided structure right here so when you actually transfer this information over to here these numbers start to make a little bit more sense so take a look that means the five carbon is pointed up this way and so hence if I have to name this line then I would say this is the five prime end and then this is the three prime end so where does the three prime that's how we read these the three prime is referring to well this carbon in this bottom left corner right here is actually the third carbon in, the, in, this, in this ribose uh, sugar molecule. So I call this the three prime end of this strand, and this is the five prime end. So these numbers are purely based on the numbering of the carbons. We probably could have done it a different way, but the scientists who wanted to, to tell us more about these molecules chose this as a way to distinguish between the th one end and the other, not just top and bottom or front and back or left and right. So this is the three prime because down here, this refers to the third carbon. And then this is five prime because the, five, the fifth carbon is pointing up in this direction. So that means if you go to the other side, notice that these molecules are upside down over here. I, I told you in order to draw this, you should flip your paper uh, rotate it around 180 degrees and then redraw the same thing. So this helps us emphasize the anti-parallel nature of DNA because this end runs from 3' prime to 5' prime, and on this side it runs from the opposite direction from 5' prime to 3' prime over here depending on how you look at it. So does this make sense? Well let's see. 3' prime end, well if I can flip this diagram upside down in my head I can see that down here this is actually the 3' carbon. And over here, this is the five carbon sticking out. So that's why this end is the three prime, and then this end would be the five prime. A little bit confusing? Okay, take a look at that. And there's a couple other resources I'll point you to in class as well, too. So that's basically how we number that and why we, why we give those, why there are these weird numbers that are there. It's just referring to the numbering of the carbons. So again, five apostrophe is, is pronounced five prime and three apostrophe is pronounced three prime ends. Okay, that's the basic thing. Now the next few things I'm gonna go through, uh, I'm gonna go through pretty quickly because we're gonna see these again a little bit later. DNA, a lot of DNA is packed into each one of your cells and out of your billions of cells, each one of those cells contains all of your genetic information to make you who you are. More on that later, that's just one of the most amazing things ever. But for now, let's just talk about physically. How do we, how do we package how do we pack all that DNA into that tiny space inside the nucleus of each one of your cells? And uh, the trick is, is that DNA, so if I can let me cover up some of these diagrams here. DNA is, here's all that DNA, okay, wrapped up in this double helix structure. It actually gets twisted around uh, these little proteins, twisted, 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 twisted. It's like making a yarn ball. It'll be easier to, if you have a little marble or rubber ball in the middle, or making a rubber band ball. And uh, it gets twisted around and wrapped and then re-wrapped again. So coiled, coiled, and further, more coiled. We call it super coiling. We'll see that in a second. Here's another diagram showing one such thing. Um, and actually, each one of these has a little name. So each little ball with DNA wrapped around it is actually called a nucleosome down here. So it's for now, it's just a simple globular structure that contains eight proteins. And we give these a name. They're called histone histone proteins and there's DNA wrapped around them. The purpose is to help us to package chromosomes uh, to help save space and be able to fit them into the actual cell. So we call this super coiling. I'm very proud of that. Super coiling. Okay. Uh, let's take a look at another, you could show you a little animation at the end if you're interested. Here's a question many of you had. What does the A and the G and the C and the T actually look like? Well, here's another image of it. But just understand that purines, pure as gold, are kind of larger structures. How can I remember that? Mm, gold bars are big and heavy. So these ones are heavier than these ones. I guess pyramids would be bigger. Okay, never mind. doesn't matter. Pure as gold. These are purines. Pyrimidine, pyrimidines to took centuries. Primidines took centuries. Thymine, cytosine, guanine, adenine. 
Okay. So that's kind of a sideways picture of what the structure of DNA would look like. So that looks more familiar to you, right? This would normally be, we would just draw it as rectangles to keep it simple. I um, think that is almost it. Finally, over here, again, this is just touching for now. We'll get into this in a lot more detail. In your DNA, so your DNA, let's pretend like this is a simplified strand of DNA. In your DNA, what does it actually do? Um, the DNA contains all the information. You already know, you know your DNA makes you who you are, but how does that actually work? How do we get from those letters into things that make sense as, as instructions? So for now, we call those instructions genes, and they are useful sequences of DNA. For example, salivary amylase, you know, is a is a, an enzyme that's in your mouth and it helps to break down carbohydrates into glucose. So that is a enzyme which is actually a protein and it's coded for by DNA using a sequence of those letters A's, T's, C's and G's. Okay, That's what you need to know for now. DNA has a lot of stuff in there and sometimes there's a bunch of letters that previously we used to think that it was called, it was just junk, like nonsense. So. Uh, Believe it or not, people actually used to call it junk DNA. Uh, we've changed the name slightly and called it satellite DNA. And depending on the type of organism we're talking about, like 5% of the total DNA could be this junk satellite DNA, or up to 50% could be as well too. Um, the reason why we've changed the name is because people are starting to find other particular functions of DNA that seemed like it didn't do anything important. Right, DNA that codes for enzymes, that's important. But when they couldn't figure out what that section of DNA was doing, they're like, oh, let's just call it junk DNA and throw it all away. Um, so in, if we go into a little bit more detail, we can separate DNA into introns and exons. Uh, introns, you can think of the word intruder. Intruder meaning we've identified parts of DNA that uh, may be uh, aren't really needed for specific messages. So what actually happens is when the DNA needs to be used for something useful, parts actually get removed and these bits can get glued back together to read something more important. So you can imagine, let's use a silly example, like if this was one of Shakespeare's plays, uh, reading from left to right, this would be Romeo, oh Romeo, I don't even know the next, ne the next line. But anyway, something like that. And then in here, it's like uh, excerpt from SpongeBob. Then the Shakespeare play continues. Here's a, an excerpt from The Hunger Games. The, the play continues. Anyways, it doesn't make sense if you read it all the way through. So we have to remove these bits right here. I've greatly oversimplified this entire process. But for now, I want you to understand that these would be considered the introns that are removed and then these are considered the exons that are put together in order to make the final message and this final message right here would spell out something very very important for example the instructions on how to make salivary amylase or various antibodies or other hormones a whole bunch of different things it could actually be Okay, I'm guessing you probably have a few questions, so go ahead and let me know what kinds of questions you have. All right, thanks a lot.